protesters in Thailand are making an ambitious statement. Previous protests over the years has also been the call to reform the country's monarch. Protesters in Thailand are not daring to go where few others have. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're watching The Listening Post, working from home. Here are some of the media stories we're covering this week. Unrest in Thailand. Protesters take on the taboo that outlaws criticism of the political system and the monarchy at the heart of it. The Turkish president sues a Greek newspaper for a front page featuring a four-letter word. The paper says, bring it on. Sports stadiums are empty, but broadcasters are bursting with ideas on how to make up for the missing fans and making a mockery online of Britain's pandemic response. When you're applying the concealer, what you Through a metaphorical makeup tutorial. As coronavirus lockdowns have gone into effect in country after country, Thailand has had a different experience. Shutting the borders and the early and widespread adoption of face masks have helped keep the numbers down there. It's also meant that political activists who have gone quiet across many countries hard hit by COVID-19 have been able to take to the streets. The latest demonstrations were sizable, and students and protesters have been zeroing in on one of the country's most taboo political and social issues, the monarchy. Whether you're an activist or a journalist covering the unrest, criticizing Thailand's royal family can land you in jail. Decades of image building, pro-monarchy propaganda, and intimidation through some strict laws have effectively immunized Thai royals against criticism. But with the pandemic taking such a toll on the economy, young Thais are demanding all kinds of reforms, and they refuse to let either tradition or legal restrictions silence them. Our starting point this week is Bangkok. It comes down to a simple hashtag. Why do we need a king? One worth a reported $30 billion in a country economically staggered by a pandemic. The biggest protests Thailand has seen since the coup in 2014 started two months ago, with students demanding the dissolution of parliament and fresh elections. One month in, the demonstrators added an explosive element to their list of demands, swinging their attention onto the Thai monarchy, the relationship between King Maha Vajralongkorn and the military general turned prime minister, Prayuth Chanocha in a country where criticizing the monarchy can land you in jail for up to 15 years. Everyone agrees that everything under a democratic system should be open to questioning and critique. If we claim that Thailand is a democratic country, then we should be able to criticize our institutions, especially the king, the person who plays such an important role in the governance of the country. You know, we're not just talking about the private life of the king, which is, of course, in Britain, the private life of the royal family have been really dissected and packaged and sold. But in, in Thailand, the press are uh, expected to self-censor some element of news regarding the monarchy. They stick to the official line, and that has been the practice over the past decade Actually, the way Thai people respect and pray to their king is not different from how we treat our parents and grandparents. Worshipping the monarchy is a common practice in Thai society. We cannot compare our way of living with Westerners because the roots of our societies are different. You cannot compare bread with Thai curry. That's a pro-monarchy voice talking but it's not how the students driving the protests see it. They're up against a government that first took power in a coup, as well as the justice system, and a Les Majest law that has been on the books since 1908. Les Majest is a French term meaning to do wrong to majesty. That law, known as Article 112, makes it illegal to defame or insult the king or the royal family. It also allows legal cases to be brought by any citizen who makes a complaint. The authorities are relying on Article 112 less often these days. They now police speech online through newer laws, such as the Computer Crime Act of 2017, which has become the Thai government's statute of choice when it wants to prosecute journalists and others who don't toe the red line. Me as Thai, criticizing the monarchy 
you could be charged, but not under less majestic is that, but under computer crime act. The law has become a political weapon, something that is so problematic, okay. you no, know, for not only for in terms of the Thai justice system, but also the human rights situation in Thailand. It is a law to shut people's mouths. The law is too broad with far too aggressive punishments. Regarding other laws similar to Les Majest, while the government can use Article 113 that relates to efforts to overthrow the government, or Article 116 relating to political agitation, the application of laws like these really obstruct efforts to build a democratic society. Thai governments that have attempted to challenge the power of the royal family have not lasted. Taksin Shinawat, a billionaire tech and communications baron, tried it after being elected prime minister in 2001. The military took him down five years later. With Shinawat in exile in 2011, his sister Yingluck ran in his place and won. She was deposed in 2014. Taksin Shinawat remains in exile, as does the academic behind one of the most influential social media pages on Thai politics. Pawin Chachaval Pongpa. From the relative safety of Kyoto, Japan, he can criticize the monarchy military complex in Bangkok without fear of arrest. Late last month, when the Thai authorities blocked access to his Facebook page, Royalist Marketplace, Chachaval Pongpan just started another one. Within days, he had more than a million followers. As an admin of this group of 1.5 million, I can tell you that 80% of them are between the age of 18 to 30, very young, very active. They know what they want and they are so tech savvy, you know. Even if one, one, one page is blocked, they know how to evade the blocking and then eventually get into it. The Facebook group Royalist Marketplace is in a way a free for all venue for people who want to criticize the monarchy. So the name is an oxymoron. So this is a satirical name. It serves as a place where you could let the steam out and uh, pretend as if Thailand now is free when it comes to freedom of speech regarding the monarchy. Many of the members do not use their real identity. So they are having a very good time saying whatever they want negatively, of course, and critically about the monarchy. We need to transform social media to enforce accountability and responsibility amongst internet users for what they do online. We do not want the kind of freedom that allows people to distort or create fake news. We, as supporters of the government, do not seek to diminish the basic rights of citizens, but online users need to be held accountable for their acts. Discussions, fact-based ones, on social platforms like Facebook grow more important when much of the mainstream news media aren't doing their job. Thailand's haven't been, ever since Prayuth Chanocha's junta took power in 2014. Arbitrary arrests of reporters have grown routine. At least 10 have fled the country. And the government has allowed intelligence operatives from other countries, including China and Vietnam, into Thailand to arrest journalists and bloggers who thought they were safe in exile. The Thai mainstream media know that questioning the monarchy is a line just not worth crossing. As for the Thai press, they've been following us to report on our protests, but there's a key problem with their portrayal of our movement. Thai journalists sometimes fail to report all the facts, or they raise important points. Basically, the Thai press don't report about the royal family, except for a daily royal news program with superficial information. What we are asking for is information about the monarchy's budgeting. We care about their finances because it affects us as citizens directly. This is the kind of thing that the Thai press wouldn't even touch. Or just report the figure, say this year the parliament has approved such and such sum of money to be used by the royal family. I think the Thai media, particularly the mainstream media, is at a crossroad. They risk becoming irrelevant. I mean, what is the press? if they don't report what's happening. 
You're supposed to do the first draft of history, and yet you just pretend that what you're seeing is not happening. What is your role as a journalist? Another media story that's on our radar this week relates to coverage of the dispute that's flared up between Turkey and Greece over gas reserves in the eastern Mediterranean. Minakshi Ravi has been looking into it. Mina, President Erdogan of Turkey has taken issue with the coverage of this geopolitical story. Which media outlets is he talking about specifically? He certainly isn't happy with what the Greek media have been putting out, Richard. Uh, Turkey and Greece both lay claim to gas reserves in the eastern Med. And over the past few months, there's been a fair amount of maritime jostling between the two countries. The media coverage has been pretty charged. One Greek paper in particular, the right-wing Athens-based Demokratia, published a pretty provocative front page. When you translate it from the Greek, it reads, F you, Mr. Erdogan. And they made sure that they put that English translation on the front page as well. Uh, President Erdogan's personal lawyer immediately filed a criminal case in Ankara in which he cited the author of the article as well as Demokratia's editors as suspects. And this isn't the first foreign newspaper that the president of Turkey has gone after, is it? No, there have been legal cases against French and German outlets in the past. But this case involves more than just the courts. The Greek ambassador to Turkey has been recalled to Athens. He made a statement in which he admitted that the headline was crass, but he said the Greek government respects freedom of speech and no action will be taken against Demokratia. The paper itself is completely unapologetic. They republished that front page with another headline, uh, which when you translate it says, come and get us. And that line about freedom of speech had to be a veiled shot at Turkey and its lousy reputation for freedom of the press. It probably was. The Turkish government can be extremely harsh on journalists in the country, and media freedoms have really been squeezed over the past decade or so, Richard. Now, one prosecution that we've covered extensively has been of the former editor-in-chief of the Turkish paper Cumhuriyet. The editor's name is Jan Dundar. Back in 2015, an article published in Dundar's paper exposed secret Turkish government shipments of arms to Syria. That article led to Dundar's arrest. He was tried in court before he fled to Germany in 2016. A Turkish government has now declared Dundar a fugitive and has given him 15 days to come back to Turkey and present himself before a judge. Otherwise, all his assets in Turkey will be seized. Remember also, Dundar lives in Germany with his wife, but the rest of his family still live in Turkey. Okay, thanks, Mina. This pandemic that has had so many of us locked down in our homes for months has also resulted in an unexpected boon for entertainment TV. Cooking shows, dramas, films on various streaming services have all had captive audiences and some big ratings. Live sports, though, haven't had it easy. First, leagues around the world were put on hold. Many of them have since resumed, but with no fans. Suddenly, live sports broadcasts from empty courts and stadiums have become one of the most innovative and creative spaces in the TV industry. We're seeing cardboard cutouts of supporters, robot cheerleaders, CGI fans, and we're hearing fake crowd sounds. The results have been hit and miss, but some of the gimmicks have grown as entertaining as the players on the field. The Listening Post's Johanna Hoos now on watching sports in pandemic times and the lengths that broadcasters will go to keep fans tuning in. Welcome to Anfield. As you can see, it's a little bit eerie, certainly with uh, what we might have been expecting. At it's been a huge watershed moment, the pandemic. Transforms sport, how we broadcast. Obviously, sport runs on passion and emotion and some of the games lack the intensity and the passion because there were no crowds there. You certainly lack it from a TV experience. I remember in March when we first uh, kind of went under, uh, the thought was, oh, oh my God, there's, there's no fans, we can't possibly do this. It was definitely harder without you know, the spectacle and fans. The most important economic aspect of sport is the TV audience but the TV audience needs co-present audience. I liken them to extras on a film, except they pay to be there. Um, so you can't have a battle scene with, without extras. And I don't think you can have a really a compelling TV sport contest without an audience on screen. And so, as the players have come back onto fields, pitches and courts around the world, 
sports leagues and broadcasters have pulled out every trick in the book, and some new ones, to create the illusion that the audience, the spectators, never really left. No way. Look close. There, there's Wheezy right there. Efforts to recreate the fans in the seats have ranged from high-tech creative... Cardboard cutouts and he almost took that guy's head off. ...to quite questionable and basic... <laughs> ...to the utterly bizarre. Stands have been filled with toys, and in the case of South Korea's FC Seoul, even a sex doll or two. Some major broadcasters, however, including Sky Sports and BT in the UK, have decided it isn't so much the visual presence of supporters as much as their audio impact that really gives fans the sense that they are watching with the crowd. Sky Sports was one of the first networks to go all in with audio. For its coverage of the Premier League, it teamed up with EA Sports, the company behind the FIFA video games. They have one of the most extensive and sophisticated libraries of sound effects, which is actually what makes their games as immersive as they are. Sky Sports acquired those sounds, and they are now key to the viewing experience that they are trying to create. And audio engineers like Adam Perry have their work cut out for them. Fortunately, we were given that freedom as operators to try and really tell a story. We weren't just pushing a button and then hoping for the best. So, I would go through, um, I would listen to each individual chant, and, and on this occasion I have 10 per club. Another sound that we have available um, is a bed, and which is, it's kind of just the sound of a stadium as if people were mingling, kind of looking for their seats. And so I'd bring in those chants again. So starting to kind of build up, you know, how you feel the game might sound as it's live. And then against that, what I would be checking is my goal reactions. So I can push it really loud or I could have it soft. But sometimes what can happen is you may think it's a goal, so you'll trigger the goal sample. Albert Lewin's at the far post and the ball. But then you realise as the commentators are speaking and explaining, oh, you know, unfortunately the player missed, you're kind of like, oh, I've, I've, I've got that wrong. And then what we are able to do if we're fast enough is then trigger off a misreaction. Post and the ball speeds across past And then kind of cover up the mistake. Despite all the work going into the audio design of these games, initially it looked like the fake sounds wouldn't catch on. When the Premier League resumed in June, Twitter was alight with sceptical fans. However, three months after football returned to our screens, Sky Sports says that 75% of those watching at home, and that definitely includes me, prefer the audio enhanced option over the silent one. Sport broadcasting is a big money business. Standard Media Index, a company that tracks TV ad spending in the United States, estimates that the suspension of just one league, the National Basketball Association, or NBA, cost ESPN, TNT and ABC almost a quarter of a billion dollars. To ensure advertisers would return and that fans continue to see value in their sports channel subscriptions, some broadcasters have gone deluxe. They aren't just faking sounds of the live event, they are using augmented reality technology to create the visuals of a packed arena. I just logged on to what I think is going to be quite a bizarre experience, the NBA's virtual fan zone. The league teamed up with Microsoft to live stream supporters into the stands and I just took one of those virtual seats. It means I can cheer on the players, I can interact with all the other digital fans in the seats, all while sitting on my sofa on the other side of the Atlantic. Fox Sports took it even further. For its coverage of Major League Baseball, it has populated the stadium with computer-generated fans. Using graphical gaming engines, we had visually replaced the crowd, and this wasn't to trick or fool the audience into thinking there actually was a full crowd, but just to normalize the experience. And we felt that, again, as game presenters, seeing that full stadium was something that the audience could appreciate. However, when you choose to visually replace crowd, it's exponentially more difficult because you need to accurately track all of the cameras, make sure that you have 
laser scans of the stadiums to map the crowds in and then finally figure out how they should be reacting. So there is a litany of complexity involved with that. These visual developments are working with the developments in sound um, to try and get as close to reality, the simulation of reality as possible. They have had to give everybody a sense, the dedicated viewer, the casual viewer, that this is worth watching. It is not an inferior product. It's not absurd. If it is a fake, then it's a clever fake. You are, just as with any other kind of fictional television programme, you're willing to suspend your disbelief. When it comes to manipulating viewing experiences, some TV networks have had an advantage. As a result of the pandemic, leagues like the NHL and the NBA were moved into so-called bubbles, sports complexes that were turned into COVID isolation zones and broadcast hubs hosting not just every player and every game, but all broadcast staff for the entirety of the season. For channels like ESPN and NBC, two of the networks airing these leagues, these indoor, confined spaces were a lot easier to dress up in the absence of fans than large, open-air arenas. The NBA was able to um, camp out in a bubble, so they were able to uh, bring a lot of technology to bear and just stay there. Similarly for the WWE, they've got Thunderdome, which is down in Orlando. They're able to acquire some residents uh, there. So number one, I think, is logistics. Number two, it's just depending on what the sport can bear. For instance, in NASCAR, which was one of the other first sports that was back, by not having fans allowed us to use some camera angles that we hadn't used before. So there's definitely some pluses and minuses in terms of uh, what you're able to do. There have been a lot of positives. One of the big wins has been the choice of being able to listen to the game, the, the natural sound of the game. And I think what you've been able to pick up is a lot of tactical conversations. You know, fascinating to hear people like Pep Guardiola and Jurgen Klopp, how they go about coaching their teams on the benches. It's been more than six months since the global lockdowns began. The coronavirus isn't going anywhere just yet, and so for the time being, the only fans in the stands are going to be digital ones. For people tuning in from home, despite all the advanced graphics and audio tricks, sports programming may never match the heights of its pre-pandemic quality. Because when it comes to televised sporting spectacles, it's not just about what the players bring to the field, it's also about what the broadcasters and the crowds bring to the game. And finally, using makeup as a metaphor for the new coronavirus restrictions in the UK that have left the public confused. British schools have now reopened, people are slowly returning to work, but gatherings of more than six people have been forbidden unless, for some reason, you want to go hunting. One influencer has taken to social media to highlight just how absurd these guidelines are. Kalechi Okafor uses a makeup tutorial format that's grown popular online to show us how to use mascara, for instance, to simultaneously accentuate our eyes and the failures of Boris Johnson's government in handling this pandemic. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. Hi, never done a makeup tutorial before, but I thought why not do one now to show you the kind of look that I go for for my eyes while I've got my mask on. Just wanna put the concealer under the kind of eyebrow area. When you're applying the concealer, I want you to kind of think about the way that the government kind of concealed the extent, the magnitude of the pandemic um, in the weeks, months leading up to lockdowns. When it comes to like choosing my eyeshadow, just um, treat it like the track and trace app that we were meant to have. Just kind of make a big deal about it over here and just kind of fade it fade it out. So it's kind of make a big deal about everything and then just kind of like fade it out around the sides. The next we go in with mascara um, and I love mascara to kind of uh, accentuate the eyes. Uh, really want to accentuate it the way that we, you know, the government love to accentuate the migrant crisis and um, xenophobia generally. Uh, whenever they need to have serious discussions about how this pandemic was handled and a no-deal Brexit. <laughs> so yeah, just uh, accentuate. So to finish, 
I sometimes like to just go under the uh, eye area very, very delicately, as yeah. delicate as our lives are under this government and that they don't take very seriously by giving us mixed messages. And there you have it.